I'm going to do California briefly because it illustrates a really unique set of issues that come together. Uh, and then we'll turn to Louisiana where I think uh, it's going to be the platform on which these issues are going to head into the public arena as we struggle for a model of national infrastructure response. Louisiana will be the template uh, on which the discussion goes forward. Not just Louisi for Louisiana, but the entire uh, American uh, coastline. California, on the whole, uh, has coastlines which will not be heavily, in a relative sense, impacted uh, by rising sea levels. And the reason is that it's on the tectonic edge of uh, continental movements. Uh, now, California and the Pacific Coast happen to be at the edge of one of these plates uh, where the tectonic activity is keeping things moving up uh, instead of down. Uh, there is one extraordinary exception, and it's called the California Bay Delta. It's an odd phrase that doesn't resonate. Nobody, it, it, it's entirely out of the public mind, uh, nationally and even in California. But the geography of that state is such that uh, between the coastal range and the Sierra Nevada is, is a, this long, low-lying central valley drained from the south by the San Joaquin River, uh, from the far north uh, from the Sacramento River. Uh, they converge uh, in a delta which is originally pre-settlement a gigantic marsh near sea level extending from Sacramento uh, down um, toward Modesto and Stockton and then coming to a discharge point in San Francisco Bay. Settlement brought about some remarkable engineering changes, a really stunning history of innovation. The first thing that happened was pretty predictable. The Thule marshes were cleared, levees were built, and it was the beginning of the most productive uh, agricultural region uh, in the country. Uh, but there were upstream water issues and water issues to the south in the San Joaquin Valley, um, which were dealt with in a really innovative way. Step one was building gigantic reservoirs in northern California uh, where uh, water is abundant. Uh, uh, it was done in the form of first a federal and then a state project. Uh, the federal project was anchored uh, by Shasta Dam, um, and then the innovation consisted of releasing water from the northern dams down the Sacramento River to run in regulated fashion, and then constructing a gigantic pumping facility right in the heart of the delta at near sea level, just before the rivers run to the sea, and constructing a canal which runs hundreds of miles directly south into the arid part of California. Uh, if one good thing is appropriate, well, the answer is you need more. So under Governor Pat Brown, the state looked at this system and said, we'll build another one. And they went to Oroville on the Feather River, way north, built another giant dam, came down into the delta and built another one of these pharaonic pumping plants connected to a canal which actually runs all the way through the valley, a couple thousand, at least a thousand feet over the Tehachapi Mountains, down into Los Angeles and on to San Diego. So at that point, we have an infrastructure system sitting on the coast that is the anchor uh, for the water system for more than two-thirds of California. So what's happening today now that 
we've come through all this. Well, climate change has arrived. The most comprehensible one, interestingly enough, to most people is up in the Sierra Nevada. Well, when all this infrastructure was put together, uh, it was recognized by the engineers that the real reservoir in California is the snowpack in the Sierra Nevada, millions of acre feet stacked up uh, across the Sierra, vastly more than the storage capacity of the dams on the downstream rivers. And uh, by a nice kind of convergence of nature and, and man, uh, that huge snowpack accumulates and stores all of that snowfall during the wet season, the winter season in California, releases it in the form of spring melt, which runs down into the big storage dams, but is carefully released exactly as the beginning of the water consumption season starts in the Central Valley in Southern California. So the reservoirs were simply a regulatory valve for the real storage up in the Sierra Nevada. And what is happening? Snow is turning to rain. The snow line is moving up, up, up. The numbers are there. You can see them. So what happens? Well, the wet season, the snow season, now turns to rain, which is moving down in big winter bursts, overwhelming the dams, which are not in the business of releasing much of it for use, and they're becoming flood control dams uh, for try to manage winter flood control without the capacity and the conservation space to store up the slow melt that runs from spring to summer. So all of a sudden, uh, the storage system uh, uh, looks to be uh, less than adequate. Uh, the big problem is that these two pharaonic pumping structures sitting right at the mouth of the river are now nearly at sea level and that three feet of water coming up will do what? Well, what it means is that the residents of Los Angeles and San Diego are going to be drinking salt water because those plants are going to be uh, in the middle of saline water coming up, rising from San Francisco Bay. Well, so what is California? Well, oh, a few other problems. Uh, the uh, levees that were put up in the marshes are uh, holding agricultural land, which is subsiding. Uh, the organic soil oxidizes and gradually settles. And so uh, you've got a land use problem uh, on top of it as um, development moves outward from, uh, particularly from Sacramento into the Central Valley. Well, what do we do about it? I'm not here to explain that. It's going to be a very large workout. It's going to involve uh, either got to move the water infrastructure to higher ground or find some way to move the water around the delta to the pumping plants. Either got to take the pumping plants up to the river or bring the river in some other way uh, through the intakes. Obviously, we have a state, federal planning and finance issue. These, this infrastructure was all built uh, under the leadership initially of the federal government, uh, and uh, California has just begun to recognize the issues, uh, although we are a long ways from a plan, which I will explain uh, my view of, which is that that plan is going to be the necessary predicate for federal participation. Uh, and it will have to be comprehensive in thinking about water use and managing urban development, land use, and the reconfiguration of agriculture. Uh, my real focus today is Louisiana, as I indicated, because I really believe that this is where, this is ground zero in the struggle to find uh, 
a thoughtful new state federal coastal land use infrastructure model uh, that is workable both in its planning mandates and in its financing. Now, when we come to New Orleans, um, I think we want to set, to Louisiana, I think we want to set New Orleans aside because uh, New Orleans is going to be protected. Uh, I, I can say that with confidence because it is a part of our national historical cultural and urban patrimony. Uh, it's upwards of a half a million people uh, more if you look out into the parishes surrounding. Uh, it has uh, a, a levy protection system that's going to have to be vastly ramped up, but I think it will be. Uh, New Orleans, uh, in the coming century, uh, will be kind of like Venice. It will be an island uh, surrounded by levees uh, sitting in the midst uh, of the Gulf waters. Uh, I think it'll be true of Homa and Morgan City as well. They are already uh, heavily levied and relatively concentrated uh, urban uh, populations. Here's the problem. There are more than 5,000 square miles, possibly somewhere between five and 10,000 square miles in the Louisiana Delta, which are currently at or below three feet above sea level. Now, you heard my consensus sea level projection of three feet. Well, if you don't like that, uh, let me offer you an additional factor, which is the delta land surface is sinking at an average rate of two to three feet in this century. Now, add and mix and match those numbers any way you want. And the answer is that we are looking at a future in this century in which Louisiana south of Interstate 10, if you, if you look at a map in your mind's eye, Interstate 10 runs south across Louisiana, uh, connects to Interstate 12 north of New Orleans, and continues in a straight line from Texas to Mississippi. That is approximately the topographic line uh, where the land, where the delta gets above three feet. South of Interstate 10, uh, the delta uh, is going to disappear. Outside of New Orleans and the two cities I've mentioned, on that five to 10,000 square miles uh, are about two million more or less rural residents. It's basically Cajun country, uh, uh, settled uh, in the 18th century and uh, well known in music, prose, poetry, and culture. But that's the, the harsh reality, which takes us as kind of a you know, forerunner, if you will, into the kinds of decisions that we're going to have to make in coastal areas around this country, mostly but not entirely in the Gulf Coast, around through Florida, back around through Florida, um, the Carolinas, uh, Chesapeake Bay, and uh, the eastern coast, uh, uh, low-lying lands. Uh, the east coast, if you will, uh, to oversimplify, is kind of the dragging end of the continental plate, which is getting nice lift on the Pacific side, but which is kind of in the spreading, going away, dragging end of the continent, uh, which is responsible for all of the extraordinary environment of the Gulf Coast, Florida, um, the Carolinas, uh, where you have this wonderful mixture of a shallow continental shelf and water interfingering with sand, sandbars, uh, and land, creating these uh, magnificent uh, Atlantic landscapes, uh, so different 
from the relatively clean line along the Pacific. Okay, enough, enough geology. You know, I was, um, I was an earth science student in uh, college, and I actually uh, got into this stuff. Uh, that's the interesting news. I went on uh, to graduate school thinking this is really my fort, this is for me, I uh, found myself in the middle of this plate tectonic geology revolution uh, as a graduate student. Uh, got rather deeply into it and I came to a melancholy conclusion. I'd go home uh, from the lab at night after swimming around in all of this math and physics thinking to myself, you know, I'm just not smart enough to really make much of a contribution here. So what am I going to do? There's still time to do something else. Um, and of course, I took what I would call the American default option. Uh, when you think, God, I'm not going to be a great poet, a great writer, a scientist, what do you do in America? You drop out and go to law school. <laughs> well, OK, let's get back to uh, sea level rise, uh, the Gulf Coast, 2 million residents, uh, 5,000 acres of land. Um, there are so far two responses uh, that lead us toward what the, the second part of what I want to discuss, which is, of course, the structural state federal response as this all comes at us. But the first one travels under uh, the name of Coastal 2050 and um, a variety of other names. Uh, it was put together by a group of scientists and engineers and, uh, and with the aid of the Corps of Engineers uh, and submitted to the Congress with a $13 billion price tag. Uh, it's a collection of ideas. Uh, it's got some riprap for some of the uh, coastal islands. Uh, it's got some demonstration uh, projects for pumping sediment into areas that are sinking more quickly. Uh, it's got some cutouts in, in the crevasses along the river designed to discharge uh, the river not way out, but closer up where some of the sediment uh, might uh, settle naturally and build some land, as in fact uh, uh, does happen in the Atchafalaya Basin out uh, to the west. But the response in Congress has been really unenthusiastic. Uh, I think for the right reasons. Uh, all these plans and all these billions of dollars don't take account of sea level rise. They're silent. They, uh, the plans have no land use planning component at all. It's as if all these little piecemeal projects here and there are going to take care of two million people uh, headed below sea level. The silence about the land use issues writ large is absolutely stunning. It's just a little collection of projects and there's not a chance. Uh, uh, some of the demonstrations say, uh, well, this project, uh, some of it, has artificially created 200 acres of new land. Well, I'm saying, what about 5,000 square miles? Give me, quick, how many acres is 5,000 square miles? I think it's about 15 million acres. And they want $13 billion to create a few acres here and there to do a little bit of riprap. Uh, it's well-intentioned, um, and the many projects are interesting, but it's a non-starter. Um, the second approach uh, comes from a more muscular, vigorous crowd uh, led by none other, of course, than the Corps of Engineers. And uh, 
That answer, as it has been for centuries, is levies. More levies. Um, and in typical core fashion, it started off as a kind of local projects uh, in response to an anguished cry from a community with a powerful member of Congress who's in an appropriation committee and something gets authorized and then years later uh, they come back and say we, we authorized it, therefore we've got to fund it. It's currently being fought out um, on a levee called Morganza to Gulf, which is a 70 mile stretch that runs down west of New Orleans. But even the builders know that one levy here, one levy there doesn't quite work. And they've been forthright enough to say, we need what is now known as the Great Wall of Louisiana. And the Great Wall of Louisiana is just that. It is a levy running zigzagging across the jagged coastline of Louisiana from Texas to Mississippi. Uh, and the Louisiana uh, delegation of federal uh, congressmen and senators are rounding up field visits, not to the Gulf, but to the Netherlands. Uh, to see if they can stir up some support from uh, saying, well, look what the Dutch did. Well, there are a couple of problems. The Dutch, yes, they did it, and the reason is it's a very small country, 50% of it's underwater, and people had nowhere to go, literally. And secondly, when they arrive in Holland, they find the Dutch saying, no, these seawalls are really not the answer. We're starting to take down our seawalls to work in a more integrated way because the price of a seawall will be not in dollars but in ecological terms will be what? Seawalls destroy the wetland fishery base of the entire region because a seawall means you've got deep water on one side and more or less dry land on the other. And uh, the richness of the Louisiana fishing industry is because of the inner uh, play and uh, the uh, tidal uh, wetlands uh, which incubate uh, the crawfish, oyster, shrimp of the Louisiana fishing industry. So it's uh, looking as if uh, the Great Wall of Louisiana and the various levy projects uh, uh, aren't, aren't going to get a lot of traction, or at least shouldn't. They're really, uh, really just not, not the way to go. And underlying it all, just not to make the point again, underlying it all is the lack of candor about what's necessary about where we go. Uh, a land use plan speaking truth to those two million people about the changes that will take place and about planning. We have the time to do it. It doesn't have to happen in one week or one month, but there's going to have to be a managed retreat. It's a complicated and difficult subject. There are a lot of interesting ways of saying maybe the whole delta uh, below three feet doesn't go. Maybe there are, uh, there are areas above three feet, the old natural levees along the abandoned river channels. Uh, the Mississippi River can be cut loose and reconfigured uh, above the bird's foot delta uh, to begin building land in a real way by literally uh, changing the outlet. But you can't possibly do that to save 5,000 square miles of land. And there has to be a land use plan which says we're going to allow natural forces to work. It's in the long range interest of the delta. And the only way we can do that is to 
accept the reality of a moving shoreline which will continually recreate an interface with enough environmental and ecological uh, 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 power to uh, be really relevant. It's what's always happened across the history of the Delta as the Mississippi has spilled off in different directions and the shorelines have moved and retreat. <laughs> and to put together a land use plan which says over time, uh, over a couple of generations, uh, we're going to adapt and we will move uh, uh, people and industries uh, in a, a thoughtful and rational way. Um, if you want a glimpse, just and none of this is going on. None of it. It's just, it's just silence. Um, uh, which leads me to say, um, the first way to evoke change is to say no to things that shouldn't be done. And maybe out of the no from the United States Congress, we can get uh, a creative, a positive creative approach to this. Um, an interesting and unlikely place to have a look at what this might look like with some imagination. Uh, this is of all places at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Uh, there is an exhibition on at MoMA in which planners and architects were invited through this charrette process they use to redesign the Manhattan shoreline in the wake of increasing sea levels at different levels, three, five, and eight feet. And the answer that comes out of this imagining process is it's not a seawall. It's not a seawall to further divide the land between urban and marine and to destroy the interface and all of its ecology but to adapt creatively with a mix of shoreline invasion, uh, adaptive approaches to uh, the construction of infrastructure. Uh, I won't try to get into it, but when you see water, uh, uh, parts of lower Manhattan looking like Venice in a living, designed environment, uh, it's not too much to ask, isn't that kind of concept something that we can import into shoreline design from an act of pure imagination to uh, a more uh, moderated, mediated uh, uh, kind of set uh, of plans? So what are we going to do? Um, I. I believe that there is an enormous opportunity here, that uh, this isn't all negative. It's only negative if we think about it in the traditional way uh, that we've dealt with infrastructure and shoreline and land use change. Uh, so what do we need to do institutionally? Well, I, uh, I'm going to run through some alternatives. Uh, but I'll start by saying we must have a national plan and we must have a realistic investment financing plan behind it. Um, and I'm going to come back to the interstate highway system, a very different achievement in a very different time. But it was an infrastructure plan which was put together and concluded effectively and efficiently for two reasons. One was a national plan which engaged the states in the appropriate manner and had financing in the form of a gas tax which was rationally related to the capital needs of the national plan. Okay, I want to... <coughs> See if I can run you through some possibilities. How do we do this? Well, the first and conservative uh, approach, the passive reactive approach, uh, uh, still in favor in 
most of the Gulf states is, uh, we'll call on the Corps of Engineers. Why do we need a new uh, plan? We have the Army Corps of Engineers. That's what they do. They're in charge of flood control, ports, rivers, harbors, levees. They've been doing it for 200 years. Uh, they uh, have uh, a lot of credibility in the Congress. Uh, the Corps of Engineers is nested in the Defense Department, safely out of the public eye, and they are a unique federal agency. There is, they're out of the public eye, buried in the Department of Defense, which guarantees that there will be no executive intermeddling here. The Secretary of Defense has never heard of the Corps of Engineers, and um, the uh, people in, in regular agencies know better than to try to tangle with uh, an agency draped with the aura uh, of the military. So what's happened to the Corps of Engineers? They have drifted into the clutches of the United States Congress in which the Corps assiduously cultivates support by making sure that there is a construction project of significant size in every one of the 435 congressional districts of the United States of America. And the budget of the Corps of Engineers is a collection, a vast collection of appealing piecemeal projects cooked up with local congressmen, and it has become an untouchable agency uh, which violates every rule of national effective governance. So, um, well, I think you get my message. I'm not. <laughs> uh, that's, that's not the right. It's not the right place to go. Uh, the core should be kind of herded back into its historic corral, uh, which is uh, taking care of navigation, of interstate navigation, making sure that the hydrology of the big rivers and the coastline uh, is being managed to facilitate the constitutional mandate of navigation. Well, okay, where do we go next? That's kind of the pure federal model. It also it doesn't have any kind of real logic to it at all. But the other model that we're now kind of hearing about is, well, it's very much in tune with kind of the politics of the time. Now, the federal government can't do anything well except raise money to give to the states. And what we need is a big new coastal revenue sharing program in which uh, there wouldn't be any of this uh, uh, you know, subversive talk of planning or anything that might be offensive to the modern political currents. Uh, the federal government will write checks. But interestingly enough, there is a new version of this getting loose in Washington. Uh, and uh, I, I think it needs a careful analysis. It's called Build America Bonds. Uh, this uh, was put up as a stimulus uh, plan, which is, of course, fair enough. But it now is starting to look like it's a permanent deal. Build America Bonds is a way of shoveling federal money out to the states in the form of expanding uh, uh, their power to issue tax-exempt bonds. Uh, build America bonds. Tax-exempt bonds, which are a, an important part of state and local infrastructure financing, work because individual investors get a tax deduction. They're tax-exempt. I'm sorry, they're tax-exempt. There's not enough power in them because corporate investors don't get the tax exemption. It's a relatively limited market. So what Congress did is that we can expand this bonding into the commercial and investment banker and corporate market by paying one-third of the interest costs. 
by subsidizing one-third of the interest costs will make them taxable bonds, but if, if by paying one-third of the interest costs, uh, they become very attractive in the corporate world. So there's been a vast expansion of state and municipal bond financing driven with federal dollars, no strings attached. And guess what? You want to see how they're being used? Go to Indiana and watch your federal dollars uh, being subsidized, uh, going to subsidize bonds to build a sports stadium in Evansville, Indiana. Now, how's that for a new form of national infrastructure financing? Uh, it makes no sense at all. It soaked up $60 billion of federal revenue last year. President Obama saying, we need a national infrastructure bank. I can fund that at $4 billion for a small start. And in the meantime, they're shoveling away. Actually, it's estimated to be $80 billion this year uh, to state and local uh, organizations which are issuing bonds for everything under the sun. But it has nothing to do with infrastructure, with sea level rise, with land use planning. It's just more money to the states. OK, you know where I'm at on that one. Uh, a variant of this, which is getting some traction, too, is uh, offshore royalties. Uh, the oil royalties for offshore uh, drilling, as, as you know, basically inside the three-mile limit, the states get the royalties. There's a, uh, a little variation. It's 10 miles in Texas and West Florida for uh, reasons rooted in medieval history. But uh, basically, Beyond three miles, the royalties accrue to the national government. Uh, the annual income now is tens of billions of dollars. I can't get any closer than that, but it's a lot. Louisiana, ever creative, is saying, we should get those royalties, or at least a big part of them. And the royalties should come only to the states where there is offshore drilling in federal waters. I mean, Louisiana gets the lion's share of what is a national asset of tens of billions of dollars of revenue flow. And I think one is entitled to ask two questions. Uh, is revenue sharing for infrastructure and whatever other purpose achieving any results when it's given unconditionally with no conditionality? I think the answer to that uh, is uh, there ain't much evidence that anything uh, is unfolding in the way of a thoughtful set of national standards or conditions. Uh, and the second is that offshore oil royalties coming in principally now from offshore Alabama, Louisiana, Texas, and Alaska are a national asset. They're a national asset, and they ought to be devoted uh, to national purposes. So I think we have reason to be skeptical of just simply uh, handing away these uh, offshore royalties to be used for whatever purpose. Well, I'm getting near to the end of my time, but I still have one more proposal on my list that is actually being bandied about in Washington. Uh, it's called a National Infrastructure Bank. Now, uh, my heart quickens to that idea. That sounds great. It's got the right words, National Infrastructure Bank. Well, I must tell you, I think it is probably neither in its proposed form, neither national, nor infrastructure, nor a bank. Uh, and let me explain uh, briefly what's going on here, because this is an idea that uh, Felix Royton, uh, uh, justly famed for his work in this area, and others have been promoting. Uh, the current leader uh, is a bill from Senator Dodd. Uh, it starts off by saying we recognize in the Corps of Engineers model, where Congress gets to 
you know, make all the pork barrel decisions won't work. So I'm going to create a five-member board appointed by the president with the concurrence of Congress. Sounds like a reasonable step. But the next question is, what's the plan? Uh, if we're going to put up federal money and get started on this, where does the planning come from? Well, the Dodd bill heads for the exits on that one. It says this five-member board will select projects based on its judgment of what's good and in the national interest and furthers national uh, goodness. Uh, it's not the exact language, but uh, <laughs> it's in fact awfully close. Uh, and don't you see the problem? It violates the man, the, the essential condition, which is I've got to have a national plan. Now, how we create the national plan and how the state and federal government does that uh, in tandem is okay. But the success of the interstate highway program is because there was a national plan. It was set out there and it was left to an appropriate mix of professionals, of national planners and state people to say, we're going to build highways. But they're going to have standards. A high, an interstate in Florida is going to have the same width of lanes, the same thickness of concrete as an interstate in Utah. And we don't want to be unreasonable at the federal level. We don't want to be overbearing. But they'll have to connect with each other across <laughs> state lines. Well, there's none of this in the Dodd bill. Uh, the other thing is, uh, these infrastructure bank bills are really aren't banks. Uh, they're grant programs. Because, you know, I know bank is a pejorative term these days, but it's a, uh, a bank is a real concept. What is a bank about? A bank is capitalized. It then lends money with what? The expectation of repayment which is what creates the dynamism of a bank. It turns over capital by advancing it, getting repayment, and moving on. That's what happened in the interstate highway program. We had a revenue source. And you could go out and front end a lot of construction, pay it off, and do it again. Um, the infrastructure bank proposals, I regret to tell you, are just grant programs with a fancy name. And I've really got my doubts as to whether uh, we have much taste in this country for a national infrastructure bank in which the feds are, whatever the machinations may be, are just going to keep appropriating money to a board of five people uh, who are saying, well, we've got an infrastructure problem. Give us the money, and we'll tell you in due course uh, how we're going to parcel it out. So, what do we need? I, I think, again, with the interstate highway program lurking in the background on two fronts. One, national planning and standards. And secondly, uh, some financing mechanism. we probably got to start from scratch. And I would create, well, what do we call it? How about a coastal restoration agency? Take your choice. Here's what I would advocate as a minimum if we're serious about getting on with this. Um, the first thing is the legislation would have standards. It would say uh, the Corps of Engineers is no longer part of this. They're just doing navigation. But we say your model is gone. We're not going to build the Great Wall of Louisiana. Uh, it's expensive. It's not cost effective. It ignores all of the issues of environment and the relative trade-off in terms of different structural and non-structural solutions. Um, and we'll put the legislators, legislators to try to defining some of those standards. Second, it would have a national standard of cost-benefit analysis not delegated to the Corps of Engineers or anybody else, but laid out in cold print. 
third, a coastal restoration agency would turn to the states and say, no money until there's a state plan. A state plan that is real, that acknowledges the numbers, and which begins with a land use plan, which says, here's what this landscape and this coastal region is going to look like at the end of this century uh, by applying these standards. And we're prepared to make the adjustments in terms of the way people live on the land and the way we build infrastructure and in the way we manage retreat on a careful, selective basis with advance notice. But to say it honestly and directly. And then Finally, I would have a coastal restoration agency created by Congress for this nationally driven purpose, response with state plans, with numbers and realism, uh, that dealt with the issue of financing because uh, it just seems to me unrealistic that we're going to have a grant program uh, in perpetuity stacked on top of every other grant program uh, in the uh, fiscal environment that we now face. And that takes me, uh, as I wind this down, again back to uh, the interstate highway program. Uh, financing of infrastructure should be tied to user revenues. Now you may ask, uh, well, what do you mean by that? Uh, in the Louisiana Delta, as we begin to do soft structure, allow coastal change, get some managed retreat. But what it means is, uh, as always, is that however imprecisely uh, the beneficiaries pay. Uh, uh, relocated roads ought to be toll roads. Uh, ports that are preserved and enhanced ought to have uh, expanded port fees. Uh, probably ought to have special taxing districts uh, administered by the states uh, in a complex of revenue-related uh, uh, income which can finance this. Uh, tax anticipation bonds are a uh, time-honored state way of raising revenue. So well, the, the concept is the same here. If you can put in all these improvements, uh, there are beneficiaries uh, who can and should pay in a federal system in which there will be substantial federal contributions, which takes me back to those offshore royalties. Uh, at that point, it would be perfectly fair to say, okay, the federal government is at the table. It's going to allocate uh, offshore royalties. It's a perfect fit. Offshore royalties, in a way, are causing the problem. That's burning fossil fuels, putting carbon dioxide in the air, raising sea levels, uh, creating all these problems. Well, in the context of a plan, uh, uh, that's a pretty good idea. Yeah. While I'm at it, I'll go back to BP and say, by the way, uh, You've been spilling all this oil for 30 months, so where's the revenue check for the royalties on the oil that uh, is in the ocean? Well, okay, that's, uh, I've exceeded my allotted time. I uh, just would leave you with uh, uh, just one closing thought. Uh, I think we can cast this in a positive way. It doesn't need to be reductionist. Uh, uh, it's got to have reality. But it is also an opportunity to create a broader land use perspective, uh, to involve the states in a meaningful way, and to design solutions which have upside to them uh, uh, in terms of a totally new way of looking at land use and infrastructure and preserving and indeed enhancing the coastal environment. Thank you. In a natural world, as the coastline changes, the barrier islands move over time inland. The difficulty is that climate change is now subject, is changing the rules. The changes take place so, so fast uh, that it's not clear to me that the barrier islands will survive. Uh, it just isn't. Uh, there's no question that the barrier islands uh, and the wetlands behind them do 
provide a measure of protection against storm surges. I think often overestimated, but the, the cost and benefits of trying to preserve them just don't, they don't pencil out in my judgment. Now, you have a professor here today from Tulane who actually has numbers. He's not just uh, an over-the-hill politician talking. He can, he can actually show you some metrics. Uh, I hope they're not completely at variance with what I've said, but uh, he will have some real information. The carbon tax is the first, whether however structured, raising the price of carbon is the first and most important step toward dealing with climate change. Um, this proposal uh, for using part of a carbon tax, directly or indirectly, is about number 1,010 in the line of proposals for using that money. Uh, and there's no question that in a national plan with revenue allocation based nationally, uh, the Louisiana should and would get the largest share of any state. The question is, how do you define that? Um, one way, possibly, is what they did in the Bro Act. Uh, the Bro Act imposed a small national tax on certain types of fishing and outboard motor uh, uh, sales, which is reallocated on a national level for wetland protection, coastal wetland protection. It's really clever of Senator Bro. He put this all together, saying a national program, uh, never mind that 60% of the wetlands are in Louisiana. Uh, that's the formula we're using. Uh, very creative. But that's what people, politicians are elected to do. There are 10 times, 20 times more mileage in the interstate highway program in California than there are in Utah. Uh, not easy, but. The Coastal Zone Management Act, in a nutshell, is conceptually a pretty good model to look at. It basically says uh, that once a coastal state opts into uh, federal funding, uh, uh, through a zone, it has to produce a coastal zone management plan, which is approved by NOAA and which empowers the state with a slight measure of control over federal activity, uh, which has largely been used uh, in its most spectacular form uh, by California to resist uh, federal offshore oil uh, development. Uh, the CZMA has been a disappointment. It, the structure bears lots of discussion. In reality, the state plans ain't much, and NOAA has really done almost nothing except say, yeah, that's okay. But the model bears revisiting. Looking at the work product uh, of recent Congresses, one uh, could be you know, driven into despair, melancholy, and oblivion. Uh, 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 what's going on, uh, and uh, <laughs> do I have uh, any hope? Yes. My despair is mitigated by my reading of American history. Uh, we are a complacent society, um, which in normal times is anti-government, which pays no attention, and the politicians uh, uh, respond Accordingly, I mean, I'm a repentant politician. I've, uh, I've been there in the halls of Congress. I, I know what lurks there. Uh, uh, but it is counterbalanced by an episodic, periodic ability to reinvent ourselves, usually in the face of crisis, and to do absolutely extraordinary things. Uh, I see it in our response, you know, in the... Uh, late 19th century, the reform movement, uh, during the 30s, the New Deal, the civil rights revolution of the 60s. Uh, there are times when people finally muster uh, the resources to put aside the cynicism and the complacency, uh, coinciding with the appearance of leaders who are serious and 
I just kind of sense that sometime, even in my lifetime, uh, we're going to get there in a new burst of this kind of creativity. Thank you very much. Thank you.